So you guys know that I don't really like to talk about controversial topics that much. You know, I'm pretty much sort of a straight shooter, just likes to keep everything, you know, safe for YouTube and stuff. So today I figured we talk about something incredibly non-controversial, uh, the Bible. That is right, everyone. Today we are doing the Bible or Bible theory iceberg. This chart is credit of user E Milo's 260 or E. M Emilo, it, that, whatever it is, sorry. Now, there's a couple things I want to get clear before we get started. For one, this is looking at theories and a lot of the lesser known aspects of the Bible itself. This isn't going to be me sitting here talking to you about how salvation works or concepts of the Bible work. This isn't a sermon by any means. This is just talking about uh, sort of interesting or cool concepts in the Bible that don't get mentioned a lot and the theories that surround them. I'm going to be talking more about the bigger implications of some of these and what it means for the concept of the canon of scripture itself. So basically we're going to be looking at the really weird stuff and I'm going to be talking about how it might work. I just want to make it clear that I am a Christian, which once again I'm not going to be sitting here trying to convert you all by any means or whatever. I'm just going to be talking about these concepts, but I want people to know that I come to it with a place of reverence. So if you believe in any of these things and I make a joke about it or whatever, I want you to know I'm just being lighthearted. I think it's very interesting, especially if you believe in the Bible, to look at some of the more far out there concepts that may not be that well known and to sort of analyze them and break them down and see what they really mean. Or if you have no belief in the Bible, even to hear about some of these concepts is not only educational, but also cool. So in other words, I'm not doing this to make fun of anyone or preach at anybody. This is just a fun look at some of the crazy things that are mentioned in the Bible. And I don't want anyone to come out of this video worrying about their faith. But do you know what you do need to worry about? That's right, internet privacy. But Worry no more thanks to today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is the do-it-all VPN that offers services that are too long to list for this ad. Surfshark not only protects your personal information while you're online, but also allows you a further reach of access when you're online as well. Like for example, take a show like Attack on Titan, which I certainly wouldn't watch because I'm definitely not a weeb or anything. But you know, if someone wanted to watch that for whatever reason, it's unavailable on Netflix in the US. But if you use Surfshark and change your location to Japan, you've got the whole show at your fingertips. I've been using Surfshark as of late, and I can tell you that there is a comfort in both knowing that you can do more and be safer while online. So Surfshark has allowed me to give you all a massive discount. If you follow the link in the description or use the discount code Windagoon at Surfshark.com, you will get 83% off of your plan. To put that in perspective, that's a little over $2 a month. And on top of all of that, they have a 30 day money back guarantee. So even if you're not so sure about it, there's no harm in getting it and then just refunding it if you're not interested. But I guarantee you that you will be. So once again, discount code Windagoon for 83% off just follow the link in the description. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring me. It means the most. Thank you all for watching, and we are back to the video. Without further ado, we are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Tier 1 begins with some relatively basic or understood concepts of the Bible itself, so I'm going to go through the first few pretty quickly. God the Father makes up the main or the heavenly part of the Trinity of the Godhead. In the Bible, God is often referred to as the Trinity, or in other parts, it is one God divided into three separate parts. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is traditionally believed as the God or the one that reigns at the top of heaven and everything else works under him. So whenever someone is referring to God, even though the Trinity is often described as one person but also three, which we'll talk about in a bit, they are referring to God the Father. God the Spirit is often attributed as working amongst men if unseen and causing things like miracles and divine appointments and sort of God in the details in everyday life. And God the Son is the next topic on the iceberg, Jesus. Jesus, which is also known as the Son of God, is not literally an offspring of God himself, or at least not in the Christian canon, and is instead the part of God that was made human for a time on earth in order to be the sacrifice for sins. So while we're still establishing God the Father, is in heaven or you could think as the soul. The Holy Spirit works on heaven and earth 
and you could think of as the spirit. And then the son of God or Jesus was made flesh on earth and you could think as the body, which is where common ideas of soul, body, and spirit come to mind. The seven days of creation refers to in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, it describes that the entirety of the universe was created in seven days. Technically, it's only six days of creation because it says on the seventh day, God rested, which is why Sabbath is set aside as a day of rest in traditional Bible tradition. There's many who believe that the seven days of creation was quite literally seven days, and those who believe it's more of a metaphor for seven years or 7,000 years or something like that. The nativity is what is referred to as the place in which Jesus was born on earth. A lot of people know that Mary was there with her husband Joseph, but a lot of the details around it get murky. For example, yes, while there were shepherds there, as most believe, the three kings were not. As a matter of fact, no one even knows if they're three kings at all. The wise men from the east, as they're referred to in the Bible, brought three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. However, it's never said how many of the kings there actually were. There could have been two, there could have been 2,000. And they didn't show up until about two years after Jesus was born, so they absolutely absolutely were not at the nativity. The New Testament is the part of the Bible that deals with everything that happened from the birth of Christ onwards. So this is the life of Jesus, it's the crucifixion, it's the resurrection, and it's everything that the apostles did afterwards. A lot of people have that general question of where the Old Testament and New Testament start and end. The Old Testament is from the beginning of creation up until the birth of Jesus. The New Testament is the birth of Jesus on. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was found by God to be the most righteous woman on earth. In the Christian scripture, she was also the only miraculous birth, or in other words, God performed a miracle and a baby simply appeared inside of her. To which she then went to Bethlehem, to the nativity, have Jesus, and the story goes on from there. Angels is a super broad topic that I'm not gonna get into this early on the iceberg because we're gonna be talking about them a lot in a second. But I wanna get it out of the way now. The depiction of angels that originated in like Renaissance France, like, you know, the cute little chubby babies with like wings who look all precious and everything. All right, well, in actuality, there's like nine different classifications of angels and none of them look like that. As a matter of fact, most of them look like this because there's a reason that every time an angel talks to someone in a Bible, they have to start with be not afraid. All right, we're on to our first good one. Elohim. So in the Old Testament, it is said that there are seven sacred names of God. Because God as it is, is sort of a fill-in word to describe a being that is worshipped or powerful and not a specific name. To give you an idea of how sacred it was believed to be, along with the other six names, whenever the authors of the Old Testament were writing it, they would stop, go get a new writing device, write it, and then throw that device away so that it could never write another word. What's very interesting about the word Elohim though, is that it is both plural and singular depending on the usage. Now, several times, especially in the Old Testament, this is in reference to the Trinity, which is the thing I mentioned in the beginning about there technically being three people that make up the one God. However, that is until you're in Exodus chapter 20, which is the 10 commandments that God gave to Moses. In Exodus chapter 20, it's specifically worded that we'll have no other Elohims before Elohim. So this implies that there are some form of lesser gods. I'm gonna leave it there for now because that topic is gonna come back up, but keep that in mind. JHVH, which is also sometimes seen as YHWH, is the reference of the Tetragrammaton. What on earth did I just say, right? Well, the Tetragrammaton is translated to Greek as four letters meaning something. There's a passage in scripture whenever God is talking to Moses through the burning bush, which is a story you may be familiar with. Moses asks the burning bush, who will I tell them sent me after God tells him to go and talk to the people of Egypt? To which God replies, I am that I am. Now that's the English translation. In the original Hebrew text, he says, I am J-H-V-H, or at least those are the letters 
most closely related to Hebrew. I can't speak Hebrew. I'm sorry. This is believed to be the quite literal name of God. Jehovah is often used as the closest pronunciation to this original four letters that we can get. And with the other spelling I mentioned, YHWH is where Yahweh comes from. Both Old Testament names referring to God. However, it's believed that this original Tetragrammaton, or the I Am as it's mentioned, is God's name itself and it is considered by traditional beliefs such as Judaism that it is so sacred it is never to be spoken out loud. I don't even know how to pronounce it since ancient Hebrew has changed so much from modern Hebrew. There are even theories persisting that the specific letters used have been changed over time so that people will not say it without reverence. The 12 apostles were the 12 closest followers of Christ during his ministry on earth. So according to the canon of Christianity, after Jesus was born on earth, he then lived on earth for 33 years, telling everyone of what he was gonna do before his death. During this time, he had 12 very close followers who believed in his teachings and stuck near him. Several of the popular ones like Paul, Peter, James, Thomas, John, and all of them are well known. But what's normally not that well known is that there are technically 14 or 15 depending on what source you go with. So for example, Judas was one of the original 12 apostles, although he committed suicide after he betrayed Christ, which again, sorry, but we'll get to. And it said after his death, Matthias became a member of the now 11 apostles. And then not long after that, Paul became a member, although he didn't stay with him, and he went to be a missionary to a larger group of people, so that's 14. And some sources outside the Bible say there was another one that joined to them, although it can't be verified, so it's like 12 in the beginning and then not 12. The Old Testament, which as I mentioned earlier, is the beginning of creation until before the birth of Jesus, is very interesting to study because the way that things work at least in the canon of Christianity, are not the same as they were then. See, according to the beliefs of Christianity, in the New Testament, or the age that we live now, we are under faith and grace and all of that. Whereas in the Old Testament, it was the age of law, and things were much more rigid, but not only were they more rigid, they were much more physical. In other words, spirits and magic and sorcery was a very common occurrence because the supernatural was much more evident. Which is also the explanation for, if the Bible's to be believed, why it went from demons and miracles happening all the time to not happening all the time. So now the Trinity, which I briefly mentioned earlier about the three members of the Godhead. So the Trinity is an often debated point because honestly, it's hard for people to understand the concept of one person that's also three people. Because in the New Testament, whenever it talks about Jesus being on earth, we see that he is definitely acting as someone apart from God. As a matter of fact, there are several times where Jesus refers to God as his father and prays in order to try to talk to him and figure out what to do. So that brings up the question, if Jesus was brought onto earth in the New Testament, where was he during the Old Testament? There is a belief that the Trinity did not exist until the New Testament, to which God essentially broke himself into three pieces in order to carry out the sacrifice of men, aka Jesus. But even in the Old Testament, there's references to the multiple Godhead. Like I said earlier, the word Elohim is both plural and singular, but when in the Old Testament God said that he was going to create humans and he was going to make them in his image, the specific wording is, let us make man in our image, which again, that is God referring to himself in the plural tense. Because of reasons like this, God is often considered as the three in one. John the Baptist is a New Testament figure that is considered the forerunner of Christ. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus who went out to people telling them that his cousin, Jesus was going to come to be the sacrifice for sins. Specifically, John the Baptist is the one who coined the phrase Lamb of God when referring to Jesus. Not only that, but he got his name as he was the first to begin baptism. Another not so fun fun fact is the means by which John the Baptist died. So he had John beheaded and then his head placed on a silver platter to put in his throne room, which is where the phrase head on a silver platter comes from. Mary Magdalene is an interesting character. She was one of the followers of Jesus during his time on earth. However, her exact details are not precisely known. 
While she didn't follow Jesus and the apostles everywhere, it seems that she did support him. There's scripture referring to her helping them outside of their capable means. It's also shown in the Bible that Jesus was very fond of Mary, and it's also believed by the majority that she is the one who washed Jesus' feet with her own hair. But to just give evidence to how much beliefs on her vary, there are some beliefs that say that she used to be a adult worker and that she changed her life after meeting Jesus, which isn't backed in the scripture, but I digress. And according to certain Gnostic beliefs, it is believed that she could have been the wife of Jesus. Whereas other beliefs like Christianity believe that Jesus never had a wife. So like I said, interpretations get messy. Judas's destiny is an interesting one to talk about. So in the Old Testament, it is said that while Jesus is on earth, that he will be betrayed and killed and that will be the sacrifice for men. Judas, also known as Judas Iscariot, is the one who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament. Specifically, he was one of the 12 apostles and he sold out Jesus to the Roman soldiers who were looking to kill him. This concept leads to a lot of debate on free will itself. The idea being, if it was prophesied that someone would betray Jesus, then did Judas even have a choice in the matter? In the Gospels of the New Testament, which is the account of what Jesus did on earth, it specifically says that the devil entered into Judas. Not only that, but as soon as the devil entered into Judas, Jesus realized it, looked across the table at the Last Supper to Judas and says, what thou doest, doest quickly. To which Judas then stood up, walked out of the room, and went to go tell the soldiers where Jesus was. So, because Jesus also told them that if they truly believed in God and Christ, the devil would not come over them, then that means Judas was never a true believer. But again, that goes back to the question of prophecy. The way a lot of people look at it is perhaps rather than deciding what happens in the future, God gave the older prophets of the Old Testament a realization of what was to come. While some even believe that perhaps Judas knew that by betraying Christ, he was carrying out the prophecy. So in a real reverse psychology way, he had to betray God in order to follow him. Either way, shortly after Jesus was arrested, Judas felt guilty for what he had done and tried to return the money that he had took as a bribe from the Roman soldiers and then hung himself on a tree in a field in Jerusalem. And on that positive note, we are now on to tier two. The flood is the event that takes place in Genesis that essentially works as a reset for the whole world. At the time, it says that every single thought of man was evil but the only righteous was Noah and his family, to which Noah built an ark and was saved from the flood itself. The flood also answers several questions, not only about history, but how things are described to having worked in the Old Testament. Without spending a ton of time on it, according to the Bible, whenever God created the earth, he put a firmament or ring of water around the earth. This not only would oxygenate the atmosphere, but would also protect people from things like UV rays. This would be the explanation of why characters like Adam and Methuselah in the Old Testament lived to be over 900 years old. So whenever the flood came, the firmament simply collapsed in on the earth, which is also why there was enough water to cover everything. And speaking of Old Testament characters, Adam named the animals. In Genesis, the first person to ever be created, Adam, while he was alone on earth, simply spent his time naming every animal. Now, it's not sure if this means he gave all of them their name, like cow, dog, whatever, or if he individually picked a name for every animal. But according to traditional Hebrew text, these names that Adam gave to the animals stuck into the generations that followed, and that's how things got their first name. Oh boy, so now we're on to one of the juicy ones, First Enoch. So Enoch is briefly mentioned in the Bible as the great grandfather of Noah. Enoch stands out as he is one of the two people in the entire Bible who never died. Instead of dying, him and Elijah were simply brought up into heaven. But aside from a single verse where it says that in the Old Testament, and one part in the New Testament where it mentions him, nothing else really is known about Enoch. However, there are three extra books of the Bible known as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Enoch. Now, these are actually to, believed to be compilations that were centered around the idea of Enoch rather than actually written by Enoch himself. The general idea behind it is that they are non-inspired, 
Or in other words, it's believed that God had a perfect plan with putting the Bible together the way that it currently is. So these writings were not part of that plan. But despite being non-canon, the book of Enoch is actually mentioned later in the Bible. Near the end of the Bible in the New Testament, in the book of Jude, they reference verses from the book of Enoch, which again, is not in the Bible. First Enoch is interesting as it is mostly written as a story about something called Nephilim, which we'll, we will talk about in just a second. Leviathan is a creature that is mentioned several times in the Old Testament in books like Isaiah, Job, and Amos, and is described as being a giant serpent that exists beneath the waters. How giant, you ask? Well, in certain Judaism beliefs, it is said to be about 300 miles long. So. That should give you a good idea. Now in the book of Revelations, which Revelations itself is a prophecy of what happens at the end of times, but that's a whole other animal to get into. It talks about Leviathan returning and being killed by an angel known as Michael. However, in that book of Revelations, it talks about Leviathan as being the vessel of Satan. So let's connect some dots here. We have the Leviathan and Satan as the same thing at the end of the Bible. In the middle of the Bible, we have the Leviathan being described as a great serpent. And then if you're familiar with the beginning of the Bible in the Garden of Eden, it says that Satan came to Eve as a serpent and got her to commit the first sin. Leading many to believe that perhaps Leviathan, this giant, potentially 300 mile long serpent, is the serpent that caused the first sin and therefore the downfall of humanity. Which I think it's really wild to think about, like what if instead of like a little garden snake that everyone thinks of, this thing was like just huge. Leviathan is also adapted into several different cultures. It's believed to be the basis for the idea of dragons from Eastern culture and principles of Orboros or the infinite loop of a cycle of the snake eating itself. So if the idea of the first sin that was ever done, which caused the downfall of humanity, that was potentially created by a 300 mile long super snake isn't cool to you, I don't know what you're doing on this channel. The transfiguration happened during the life of Jesus. At what point during the life of Jesus, he took three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John to a mountain that was later called the Mount of Transfiguration for obvious reasons, to which as the disciples watched, a light shone down from heaven as Jesus was joined by Moses and Elijah, which fulfills a prophecy at the end of the Old Testament that whenever the true savior comes, Moses and Elijah would be there with him. And as the disciples were watching, a voice from heaven said with a booming voice, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, which goes back to the whole God the Father and God the Son thing. According to Christian tradition, this is seen as an important moment in the life of Jesus, as it is quite literally a direct show, if anyone had any doubts of this not being the Son of God, that God said, this, this, this is my boy right here. Now I get to talk about angels, starting with cherubs. So cherub, which plural form cherubim, are often the ones depicted as like the little baby angels for some reason. I want to emphasize they look like this. Cherubim are one of the most commonly mentioned angels in the Bible. For example, it is a cherubim who is said to guard the gate at the Garden of Eden. They are said to transport the throne of God itself, and they are the ones whose image is made on top of the Ark of the Covenant. As Ezekiel describes them, they have four wings and four faces that constantly change out, and they move like lightning, flashing in and out of places. So, you know, it totally makes sense why someone looked at this thing and was like, yeah, that, we can make that like a cute baby for like stupid artwork, that'd be cool. Not that like Renaissance artwork's stupid, I don't mean that, but like it really grinds my gears that all of the holy like fear and um, frankly coolness that angels have was put away because some people were like, yeah, but but that looks scary. I don't I don't want scary angel. I want little baby angel. That that's what makes me feel safe from the devil. Satan is the prince of this world is a interpretation or sort of something to be extracted from mentions of Satan in the Bible. Satan is specifically described as the prince of the air. This is mentioned in Ephesians, which in the same verses, it talks about spiritual wickedness in high places and the evil that exists on earth. Not only that, but whenever Satan tempted Jesus for 40 days, which 
is a thing that happened. Jesus referred to Satan as the earthly ruler. This basically all goes back to the idea that sin and evil exist on earth and those who don't repent are allowing themselves to be open to attack essentially from Satan. So therefore, according to the Christian idea, this is a way of saying that Satan has power over those who are not given to God. Oh boy, the Nephilim. So in Genesis chapter six, so Nephilim as they're mentioned in the original text are in reference to a species or group of things that came to exist whenever the quote unquote sons of God mingled with the daughters of men. We'll talk about theory in a second, some believe this to mean that maybe the sons of God is quite literal and it's saying angels mingled with humans and created offspring. Whereas some are saying that children who were holy and followed God mingled with those who did not follow God. Either way, their product or offspring were known as Nephilim. Nephilim were feared people throughout the Bible. And as a matter of fact, several of the enemies of the children of God who've seen throughout the Old Testament are these Nephilim. Here's the fun part. Nephilim is the original Hebrew word. The word in English is giants. That's right. The Nephilim are the original Old Testament giants. Or again, according to the canon of scripture, giants themselves are these interbred children, essentially, between potentially angels and man. Actually, you know what? Just so I don't sound dumb, I'm going to read it. And don't worry, this isn't going to become a Bible sermon. I just want you to hear it directly as it said. Okay, so this is Genesis 6 verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Remember first Enoch that I mentioned earlier, how it's not canon of scripture, but it is still believed and read by many? Well, basically the whole first part of the book of Enoch is the story of where these giants came from. The book of first Enoch tells a whole story of this group of angels known as the Watchers, who began to fall in love with the daughters of men or women essentially from afar, to the point that they fell from grace in order to come and mingle with the people on earth. Not only that, but these watchers who fell to earth began to teach humans how to do things like witchcraft and magic and other things that would explain why in the Old Testament these supernatural elements come from. Now again, First Enoch is not in the canon of scripture, so that is not widely believed by any means, but that does not mean that some do not believe it. I should also mention just as a counterpoint, Adam had a righteous child and a non-righteous child, the bad one being Cain and the good one being Seth. So several believe that this possibly means that instead of son of God and daughters of men, it is saying the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain intermingled and that's where Nephilim came from. Either way, I don't care because it's giants directly mentioned by name and I love it. God's throne is believed to be in the highest or deepest part of heaven. It's only mentioned a few times throughout the Bible. The only time it was directly seen on earth was by Ezekiel, who is the same one who has the testimonies of how several of the angels behaved. Whereas people like the prophet Isaiah directly viewed God sitting on the throne. This is described as being quite literally a throne with something called seraphim, which look like this, surrounding him and going out from him as messengers to perform tasks. Other than that, not too much is known. It's said that there is a seat for Christ at the right hand of God, which again points towards the Trinity being more separate beings than always one person. And that constantly surrounding God is this choir of angels who are singing in unspeakable tongues, praise and holiness. Everyone who viewed the throne including Paul, who described it as quite literally words that cannot be said, all maintain that the glory that they saw was completely unspeakable. Which I mean, yeah, it's gotta be a lot for like anyone to directly view God <laughs> and all the angels at the same time. Like that, that's gotta be a lot. <laughs> Whoops, kind of jumped the gun on this one and talked about it earlier, but uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament, like I said, the fact that Elohim is used as both plural and singular, and the fact that God said, make man in our image. Um, yeah, whoops, accidentally got to that too early. 
Moving on, Behemoth, or Behemoth as it's often called, is a sort of controversial passage that's mentioned in the book of Job. So the book of Job's in the Old Testament, right? So before the life of Christ and before sort of modern times. Now in other places in the Bible, Behemoth is used as an adjective, like they speak of the Behemoth acting men and stuff like that. However, Job specifically mentions a creature he refers to as Behemoth, which he gives details like having bones of iron and mighty jaws and a tail like cedar. And while there's no conclusive definition of what this is, a lot of people point towards things like the tail of cedar, meaning that this was a dinosaur. Especially since the reason Job's describing it is how great and mighty and huge it is. This would mean that dinosaurs had to live after the Great Flood, and either been hunted out or died out at some point after. I should also mention that the second most popular theory about it is that it's a hippo. What? Anyway. <laughs> Like that's such a crazy jump. It's either like a stegosaurus or a big water horse. We are now on to tier three. Mammon specifically comes from a phrase that Jesus said. In the gospels, which again is the testament of Jesus's life on earth, while talking to the apostles, Jesus says, one cannot serve God and mammon. Now in most interpretations, mammon is believed to be exactly what mammon is in Hebrew, which translates to wealth or greed. However, some believe mammon to be a quite literal figure or entity that Jesus is telling them not to serve. So much so that this was used as evidence in something during the Middle Ages that was known as the Seven Princes of Hell. Which I won't spend too much time on that, but essentially the idea is that there are seven princes or sort of rulers who exist in hell and each one of them personifies a different sin and that's where the seven deadly sins come from. Which mammon would of course be greed. Also if you're curious, Lucifer himself would be pride. Divine snakes is in reference to several sort of holy snakes that are used throughout the Bible or used in miracles. For example, Moses throws his staff on the ground in the Old Testament and it turns into a snake before Moses picks it back up and it turns into a rod. Which also brings in more questions when you think about it, like when he threw down the staff, did that create a new snake? And then we picked it back up did the snake like die or has the staff always been a snake or wh where do these wh where is god getting all these snakes furthermore serpents specifically hold a sort of crucial place in a lot of biblical stories not only the serpent i mentioned earlier and tried to sort of maybe imply that it could have been leviathan or during the time that the children of god were being attacked by fiery serpents and moses put a serpent on a staff or the multiple references to the devil himself being a serpent in the bible there's a a lot of snake imagery and some believe the form of a snake to be the actual form of the devil. Acts of Peter, like First Enoch which I mentioned earlier, is one of the non-canonical parts of scripture. Or in other words, it's about tales around scripture that isn't actually in the Bible. One of the reasons it's not and hasn't been accepted because similar to First Enoch, the credibility of it is questionable. Acts of Peter is believed to have been written by Lucius Charinus, Shurinus, however it's pronounced, who was a companion of John, one of the apostles. However, he himself was not an apostle, so he wasn't directly inspired by God, and yada yada. What's interesting, and that a lot of people don't know, things that are said in the Acts of Peter are not said in the Bible, although people think they are. For example, Peter's death is never mentioned in the Bible. However, here in the Acts of Peter, it talks about how Peter was crucified upside down, along with several miracles that the apostles performed after Jesus left. It's very interesting because despite not being in the Bible, a lot of people use information from it without knowing it's not part of the Bible. Like I guarantee you, and I'm saying this as a Christian, you could go up to like 60, 70% of Christians who know the Bible and say, how did Peter die? And they're like, oh, he was crucified upside down. It's like, okay, where does it say that? Uh, um, it's, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> All right, so the watchers are interesting. They are mentioned in the actual Bible in the story of Daniel, whenever Daniel is talking to the King Nebuchadnezzar and they communicate to each other that they saw watchers come down from heaven in order to speak to the king. So watcher in this form is being used to describe angels of some sort. Keep in mind the book of Enoch, which I talked about earlier, talks at great length about these watchers and says they're the ones that came down from earth, or at least some of them came down to earth when they fell from grace 
and created the giants on Earth. So, many believe that perhaps Watchers are the classification of angels that demons originate from. Because, as it's mentioned in the Bible, whenever Lucifer fell from heaven, a third of the angels fell with him and they became the demons, or as they're called, devils on Earth. So, this is another one that's open for a lot of debate. Are the Watchers their own classification of angel? Is it just referring to the angels that went bad? Who knows? The Son of Man in the Fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, so story time. In the Old Testament, remember this is before Christ, which is going to be important in a second. The king I just mentioned, Nebuchadnezzar, was not a very nice dude at all and decided to throw three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were followers of God, into a furnace to kill them. After he threw them into the fire, they didn't die, and then after looking into the oven, instead of just being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said that he could see four people in there with him, and the fourth is as the Son of God. Now, if you're following along, this creates a few issues. For one, this is before the New Testament, or as it's understood when Jesus came to earth. Jesus is understood to be the Son of God. So this specific phrasing, the fourth looks to be the Son of God, implies that Jesus was able to be present before the New Testament, which again, it makes things a little wonky. Two, how on earth did they know what he looked like? He specifically says it looks as the Son of God. And then third, to add another layer of confusion to this whole thing, Nebuchadnezzar immediately pulls the three of them out of the fire and starts to ask for forgiveness because, you know, watching them not die in the fire was pretty good proof that maybe they know what they're talking about. He tells them how great it is that God sent his angel to save them. Okay, so now it is the son of God and also angel. And I'm not trying to get personal with this. Everything that I've said to this point has been me objectively looking at it. But when it comes to translational stuff like this, it, it's all subjective, so I have to be a little personal. In my personal interpretation, as we talked about earlier, with the potential of giants being quite literally sons of angels, and it refers to the angels as sons of God, then whenever Nebuchadnezzar here was saying it looks to be a son of God, and then immediately says God sent an angel, I think he was meaning angel. Because at this time, before the actual Son of God, aka Jesus existed, Sons of God was used to refer to the angels. So yeah, that's my best guess at it. The beloved apostle is interesting. So during the life of Christ, if you'll remember I said that there were 12 apostles, there is one apostle that keeps being referred to as the beloved apostle or the apostle that Jesus loved. What's interesting is it's never directly said which apostle this is. Now, Jesus loved all of the apostles, but it's shown that he shared a very special kindred spirit with this one specific one. For example, at the Last Supper, it says that the beloved apostle was laying on Jesus' shoulder and listening to him speak. And whenever Jesus was dying on his cross, it says that he was looking down at his mother and the beloved apostle to which he told his mother this is your son now and he told the beloved apostle this is your mother now take care of each other so again while jesus loved all the apostles it seems that he had a very special broship with this one in particular however at the very end of the book of john which is again one of the gospels that talks about jesus's life in the last two verses it says jesus spoke to his beloved apostle which is the apostle currently writing this scripture. Implying at the end of John, it is revealed that John himself is the beloved apostle. That's the most common and it makes a lot of sense in the whole canon of the gospel. For example, it makes sense that John would be with Jesus through his entire walk, so then Jesus would entrust him to take care of his mother. However, there are some more theories. For example, Lazarus, who is famous as being one of the people that Jesus raised from the dead. It's referred to that Jesus loved both him and his sister, and after Lazarus dies, Lazarus' sister comes to Jesus and said, he who thou lovest is dead. There's some that also say it may have been James, as well as one theory that says the beloved apostle was purposely never named because at the time they were being hunted down by the Roman soldiers and since this one was never seen with Jesus by any eyewitnesses, they kept his name a secret. However, like I said, and I know I'm getting into opinions again, 
John saying it was him is a pretty surefire sign that it was like probably him. Come on, guys. Acts of John is the same thing as Acts of Peter. As a matter of fact, it is believed to be written by the same guy who wrote Acts of Peter. It is tales of John's life and the other disciples that is not part of the scriptural canon. A lot of the Acts of John is more of a personal introspection into the disciples themselves and even Jesus. For example, it talks about how Jesus enjoyed singing, which is neat, as well as describing more miracles that the apostles performed. Naked Boy Fleeing from Gethsemane is a really random and weird one. So in the book of Mark, which again, one of the gospels that talks about the life of Jesus, for two verses, out of nowhere, it says, while Jesus was being arrested by Roman soldiers, so this was immediately after Judas betrayed and told the soldiers where Jesus was, that a boy who was naked and nothing except a linen robe that he was wearing around them began to follow the parade of soldiers that had Jesus arrested, to which the Romans tried to chase him off. They ripped the linen off of him and he ran into the night naked. And that's the only mention of it. Just, it never gives him a name. It just says the young boy. Um, he literally shows up out of nowhere. He leaves literally into the night and that that's it. That That's all we got. Now, while it wasn't, 100% uncommon for people to be naked except for one robe that they wear around them. Uh, the wording's interesting. So the specific wording as it's originally written is a linen cloth and the way it's written in Hebrew is never said anywhere else throughout the Bible except when it's talking about burial clothing. All right, so here's the theory people go with and bear with me for a second. So several times throughout the Bible, we see the Holy Spirit or the power of God being used to raise people from the dead. Like obviously we have examples in the Old Testament where like Elijah put his staff on a young boy and he came back to life. Or whenever Jesus told Lazarus to arise and Lazarus walked out of the tomb. But we also see it happen in sort of incidental ways. For example, whenever the prophet Elisha died, he was buried and put into a cave to which then someone else was being buried in that cave. And while they were being buried, their body touched Elisha's and it said the spirit essentially shocked him back and the man who was being buried came back to life. So we see here again, according to the Bible, the power of God directly creating miracles of bringing life back. All right, so again, bear with me on this. Whenever the Roman soldiers came to approach Jesus, they asked Jesus, who are you? And Jesus said, I am. If you'll remember back in tier one, the original name of God, which is to never be spoken, is believed to mean I am, which is why the English translation is I am that I am. It's said that in the garden, whenever Jesus replied with this I am, there was a rumbling and a sort of shock wave that went out. Because again, going off that theory I mentioned earlier, he said the actual name of God, which is powerful and not to be spoken. And the Garden of Gethsemane is located immediately next to a graveyard. So off of that, is it possible that Jesus said the true name of God, which was so powerful that as it says, it rippled through the men there. And just like with Elisha's body caused enough spirit to raise someone from the dead. And that's why a naked boy was following Jesus, trying to see who it was that brought him back from his dead in nothing but a burial cloth. I don't know, because like I said, the boys only mentioned for those two verses and never again. And I know I'm reaching and I don't want to be sacrilegious, but again, we're talking about theory, we're talking about concepts and I think it's really cool and a little too cool not to. The Apocalypse of Abraham is very similar to the Book of Enoch in that it is a book written around the idea of an Old Testament character that's not part of the Bible. A lot of the Apocalypse of Abraham talks about Abraham's early life and how he helped his father make false idols of lesser gods. Not only that, but it says that whenever it comes time for Abraham to learn what his destiny is as the follower of God, that God shows him everything. By everything, I mean from creation through all of time to where he sees God himself, and then he sees how time's going to end, which is why the book's called The Apocalypse of Abraham because a lot of the focus on it is how the world ends. And again, while not a part of the accepted Bible, which people believe, the story is very interesting. For example, Abraham travels with the agent Yahoel, which I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and to which Yahoel does 
battle with the demon Azazel. And this would also be one of the first mentions of Christ specifically, as God says that there will be a man to come and make a remediation for sins. Which, looking at it on a timeline, the idea that this could, and again, this isn't part of like true scripture, so nothing definite, uh, or at least nothing definite in the Christian context, but the idea that Christ could have been mentioned that far back is really something. Unknown miracles reverse to the last verse in the book of John. This is said immediately after the part I talked about earlier where John says that he is the beloved, to which he then continues. Actually, you know what? Just like I did for the other one, I'll just read it. In the last verse of John, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. In other words, John is saying here that Jesus did so much while on earth that the world could not contain the books of everything that happened. This implies more miracles, this implies more teachings, this applies more doctrine, which all implies that what we get out of the Gospels or the four books that talk about the life of Christ are just a fraction of everything Christ did while on earth, which also explains away a lot of the historical inaccuracies, as some say, of the Bible. For example, in the Bible, it talks about a lot of locations that Jesus visited and what he did, but then some will point to a location in which Jesus was seen and taught, but it's not mentioned in the Bible, so people consider that an inaccuracy. But as John just said, the Bible doesn't contain everything he did, he did a whole lot more. The Witch of Endor has caused a lot of debate, as it seems to be a witch performing actual necromancy. Without giving the background, the wicked king Saul was trying to find a witch to speak to the dead prophet Samuel. So Saul, under cover of night, goes to this Witch of Endor, as she's called, and she is able to conjure up the spirit of Samuel. So this raises a lot of questions. How could someone that is not a true follower of God perform a miracle, such as bringing someone or at least their spirit back from the dead? The common belief, or at least the most common belief in Christianity, since this is only the one time it's mentioned, is that because of Saul's sin, Samuel was sent by God to challenge Saul directly, and it wasn't because the witch was powerful, it was because Samuel, which he did, was about to punish Saul. However, some believe that necromancy is quite possible, and here's a biblical example of it. Sam Yaza, which I don't have a lot to say because I wasn't able to find a lot of distinct information on, is the leader of the Watchers that is mentioned in First Enoch. Now this gets into a whole lot bigger implications, right? If First Enoch is not an actual part of the Bible or an illegitimate part of the Bible, then how does it have all of this information? How is there this hierarchy of angels? Were the Watchers real, etc., etc.? Remember how I said there were three books of Enoch? Well, while the third one's not really related, the second one is quite odd. So if you remember, I said the character of Enoch himself ascends to heaven without having to die. Well, the book of 2 Enoch talks about what he saw on his way through heaven. Specifically, it describes in detail a 10-layered heaven with each layer being a different place, with God himself residing at the 10th layer. Now, ideas of a 10-layered heaven are adopted in different biblical religions, many of the sources coming from this in the second book of Enoch, but between his description of the 10-layered heaven and the talk of celestial war shortly afterwards, a lot of beliefs or the majority of beliefs don't agree with it. Because as mentioned with the Acts and the Apocalypse of Abraham, it isn't really something that can be verified. And we are now on to tier four. Papias's account of Judas's death is pretty gruesome. So Papias is a sort of scholar who's believed to have been a companion of John. I guess John just got along with everybody, must have been a real cool guy. According to history, what Papias would do is he would talk to people who were closely associated or near Jesus, as he himself never was, and figure out stories around scripture itself. Now, his source can't be known, again, this was in year like 80, but according to what he wrote down, Judas did not simply find a tree and hang himself. What instead happened, and bear with me, was he tried to hang himself, to which the rope broke, and he fell, and essentially exploded, and it says his bowels covered the field. Now, on top of that, Papias says that Judas embodied every sense of ungodliness. In other words, he was incredibly gross, and diseased, 
and didn't take care of himself and all of that. So as he so eloquently describes it, he could not fit through the doorway which a chariot could fit. Now, and again, this is kind of like getting back to my personal opinions. For a long time, Judas was a member of the 12 disciples, so to some degree, he had to at least look the part of being a follower of Christ. And I don't think a lot of people that weren't kings got by on being that rotund in these days. Because you gotta remember, the disciples were walking with Jesus like a marathon's worth of distance to get from one town to another. So it's in my opinion that this particular account, as well as his description of Judas, just comes from the fact that people at the time really didn't like Judas <laughs> because they saw him as the reason that Christ died. So I think a lot of their upsetness came out in calling him stinky and ugly and other not nice things. Different angel types. So I've kind of briefly alluded to it earlier with cherubims and seraphims and all that, but to be specific, there are nine different types of angels. Not only are there nine different types of angels, but they are in three different categories of description. There are the angels who directly correspond with God and are in the upper tiers of heaven, which are the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones. Well, I've already mentioned the cherubims and the seraphims. The thrones, also known as ophelims, look like this as Ezekiel described them, spinning wheels within wheels with eyes, and they spoke with thunder and trumpets, which I'm once again emphasizing, be not afraid, <laughs> that essentially exists near God in the highest level of heaven. On the second tier, you have the angels that are still in heaven, but are concerned with the acts of men, which are the dominions, the virtues, and the powers. And then finally, you have the angels that directly interact with man, which is the principalities or princes, archangels, and guardian angels. Guardian angels is an interesting one because they are mentioned in the Bible, but it's unsure if it means another kind of angel that is acting as a guardian or if that is specifically the form this angel is. So eight, maybe nine types of angels, basically. Which I could go into all the other ones, but there's only so much time in this video and this video has already been going on pretty long, so we'll head on. May do a deeper dive into angelology one day, Gotta work myself up for it though. Cain's death is referring to Cain, the brother of Abel, who committed the first murder. Because of his sin of killing his brother and again committing the first murder, it's said in Genesis that Cain is forced to walk the earth. Now, it's said that Cain was afraid of walking the earth because some group of people would find him and kill him, so God gave him a mark that would protect him from death. And that's the last that Cain's ever mentioned. There's no story of his death or what happened to him afterwards in the Bible itself. Part of a legend that sort of cropped up through the Middle Ages is that of Lamech. Now Lamech is mentioned in the Bible as the grandson or maybe great grandson of Cain and Lamech confesses to having murdered someone much like his grandfather before him. However, the story that began to pop up around the Middle Ages is that Lamech was out hunting and that the mark of Cain was actually goat horns. This was due to the association that was rising during the Middle Ages of goats being demonic. According to that, Lamech was out hunting and then his son saw goat horns, had Lamech shoot at it, and it turned out to be Cain. Also, in another non-part of the Bible part of scripture known as the book of jubilees in research for this i began to figure out there are a bunch of books that did not make tryouts but in the book of jubilees it says that cain's house fell on top of him and he was crushed to death however like i said none of these are part of the main bible and there is a very common belief that cain is still alive to this day the idea being that whenever god said you are forced to walk the earth and this mark will protect you from death he quite literally meant you will walk the earth and not die. The idea being that Cain is forced to forever roam and somewhere out there now exists as possibly just a homeless vagabond or a man wandering through a town as the son of the first man and the man to commit the first murder. I am once again stating if you do not think this is cool, I can't help you. St. Paul in third heaven is another one of those quickly mentioned things that causes so many questions. 
In the book of Corinthians, whenever Paul is talking about the visions of heaven that he had, he specifically says, I entered the third heaven. Now, remember, the whole thing about Enoch seeing the ten-layered heaven is not part of the Bible, which means this is the only reference in the Bible to there being like a multi-layered heaven. Now, this also doesn't line up with what Enoch said, because according to Paul, this third heaven that he went to was a paradise and that Jesus was there to be with, which, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is supposed to be at the right hand of God's throne, which according to Enoch is on level 10. So what's that about? If it's that, I guess you could throw out Enoch, sure. But also, why did he say third heaven? Why did he have to do that? Because if he would have just said heaven, everyone would be like, oh, that's sweet. Paradise, Jesus was there. That's cool. But because he said third heaven, it's, uh, and that's also the part I was referring to earlier whenever Paul said he quite literally saw unsayable things. Now, the common interpretation is that this implies a sort of division. For example, there is the part of heaven that God and the Godhead are in. There's the part of heaven for the angels, and then there's the part of heaven for the saints. There could be evidence of some division between God, the angels, and man while in heaven, but again, no one's really sure. St. John helping Mary is the part I was talking about earlier whenever I said that the beloved, which we're referring to as John, and Mary were supposed to take care of each other. The thing here is that Jesus had a family, which would also be his mother Mary's family, and Mary was married to Joseph. So, where are they at this time? Why does John need to take care of her? Since Joseph is never mentioned after the early life of Jesus, many point this as the fact that Joseph may be dead. Or at the very least, and I don't want to make too many assumptions, Jesus' family, since Jesus is now being crucified and is essentially a war criminal, may have abandoned them at some point. Regardless of the circumstance, Jesus saw it fit for John to take care of Mary. Dead resurrected along with Christ. Another one of those really quick mentioned things that just, okay. So it says that whenever Jesus was resurrected from the grave, to which he died, was buried for three days, and came back. It says when all this happened, and he came back, that the dead in Christ were risen, and that they went and appeared back to the people of their town. This is similar to the theory that I postulated when talking about the naked boy in the Garden of Gethsemane, that the holiness or the power that emanates from Jesus is enough to coincidentally cause life or the spirit to return into these bodies. But what's interesting is supposedly all of these graves were open and people came back to life, and they're never mentioned again. <laughs> no number of how many, how widespread this was, just that several graves were open and people came back. And it's quite possible because at the time of the writing, which was in the book of Matthew, again, one of the gospels, that Matthew didn't know, so he couldn't say or make up a number for how many came back. And I guess since nothing said about him, the common belief is that people just came back to life and then they just lived a normal life until they died again. This is more so of what I was talking about earlier, as I said, of that sort of offshoot or residual power of God. Balaam's significance refers to the character in the Old Testament known as Balaam. Balaam was a sort of prophet for hire who served false gods. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even one of the people of God and was instead their enemy. The story of Balaam goes that the king tried to have Balaam come up with a prophecy that would damage the children of God, but Balaam wasn't able to come up with one and was instead just giving them blessings, which made the king upset. The reason for this is that God was essentially speaking through Balaam. The reason Balaam holds significance is because he was not one of the children of God, but he was a prophet. It is said he was a prophet for other gods, which what does that mean? And just like the witch at Endor, it implies a supernatural power existing outside of God himself. Many attribute stories like this to demons or the wickedness that's referred to by Jesus in the New Testament as where these people derive their power. Whereas beliefs like Gnosticism take this and use it as a background for the belief in a non-monotheistic interpretation of the Bible. Simon Magus was a sorcerer who tried to become one of the apostles. He's briefly mentioned in the book of Acts, which talks about what the apostles did after Jesus' resurrection. As it says, he was a sorcerer who saw that the apostles were performing miracles, so he came to them with money to try to pay them to make him one of the apostles so that he could gain their powers. To which the apostles explain, we don't want your money, and it's not what it's about, we're here for Jesus, not 
magic tricks. And in the canon of scripture, that's that. Well, remember the Acts of Peter, which I mentioned earlier, which is like the non-accepted story of like what the apostles did afterwards? Well, it's got a lot more to say about him, as it says that later, Simon challenged Peter to essentially a magic duel, in which Simon began to fly around and was like, ha ha, your God can't stop me. And then just <laughs> Peter like <laughs> essentially zapped lightning at him from God. And then everyone got mad at Peter and that's why they crucified. You can see why the acts of Peter aren't accepted, right? <laughs> Quite literally the only mention ever of someone flying. Like, okay. Again, already hard to verify as actual proof of disciples. Even harder to verify when you start talking about a side character being the only person to ever fly. <laughs> the Gospel of Nicodemus is again another one of the non-canonical entries in the Bible. However, this one is from the point of view of Nicodemus, who was a man who spoke to Jesus in order to try to figure out what salvation means and what God means. And similar to the Acts of Peter, there are pieces of this that are believed by Christian sects who don't even know that it comes from the Gospel of Nicodemus. For example, there are several denominations who believe that in the three days between Christ's death and resurrection, that Christ went to hell. But he didn't go there as a sinner, he instead went in order to raise souls out of hell. In some interpretations, he went down there and brought up everyone who had ever died but was righteous because Jesus wasn't dead yet and that's a whole other thing to get into. While some say that he went to hell to save Adam, as Adam who had committed the first sin had been cursed down there, but now that there was a payment for Adam's sin, i.e. Jesus, he, Jesus went directly to hell to pull Adam out. Also earlier, whenever I was talking about Mary and how it's not sure what happened to Joseph or her family, in this Gospel of Nicodemus, it says that Joseph was arrested for being the father of Jesus, who was essentially branded a terrorist. Or, I mean, now we call him terrorists. They call him a blasphemer now. The government didn't like him, basically. There's also a really cool addition in the Gospel of Nicodemus called the Acts of Pilate, which seems to be the letter that Pilate, the guy who sentenced Jesus to death, the letter that he wrote to the ruler of Rome saying that they probably messed up killing this guy. After everything we've said, like when the guy was arrested, he like brought people back from the dead by saying his name. And then like after he came back from the dead, even more dead people got up. It's like at some point you just got to take the L. And we are down to the final tier with tier five. Jesus changed his body after crucifixion. This is in reference to something that isn't really thought about. So whenever Jesus died, he was, you know, deteriorated and not doing well. However, he came back in, as it said, perfect body. Not only that, but he was able to perform supernatural tasks, such as appearing and disappearing to people and walking through walls as he did with the apostles. Not only that, but after he comes back, there's no reference of him eating, drinking, or sleeping. This asks a lot of questions about what happens to us after we die, or at least in the Christian context, as it's believed we're given a new body, perhaps it means a new perfect body that looks like us but isn't cursed with things like, you know, dying. Christ's family is in reference to the physical family that Christ had while on earth. So we know about his parents, Mary and Joseph, but he also had three brothers and several sisters. What's interesting and may not be expected is that it's mentioned several times that his family didn't really understand him. While Mary knew he was special as he was conceived miraculously, it says she loved her children the same. Despite this, there are several times when Jesus was young, and remember Jesus, according to biblical canon, was a perfect person, in which his family <laughs> kept trying to make him stop doing whatever he was doing. They would be confused why so many crowds would gather around. And during one of Jesus' first speakings, they were trying to find him, saying that he's going to get himself in trouble. It's so interesting to think that, assuming you believe like in this, or believe in the potential of it, that the family of the savior of humanity still didn't really get what he was doing. Biblical stories in other religions refers to the concept of a origin point with a lot of these stories. Like for example, the flood, which I talked about earlier. Nearly every mythology or religion or belief system has a form of the flood in it. This points back to perhaps there was a flood or a flood similar event, 
or at the very least a story of it that was adapted to every other culture. The same can be said about the Tower of Babel, about the plagues, about the dispersion of men, about angels, demons, gods, all these concepts that are seen across all these different cultures, even Leviathan that I talked about earlier, seem to have some sense of commonality, which makes you wonder. One God Lord, but many lesser gods. So this is the thing that I've kind of been alluding to. So with examples like thou shalt have no other gods before me, or the idea of Balaam serving pagan gods, then what exactly could these lesser gods be? There's several different theories around this, some of them quite literally saying maybe, yes, there are lesser gods to some degree, whereas others say perhaps these other gods that are being served are the devil and his minions. Whereas I'm going to interject my own theory because I think it's the coolest, and that's the concept of the God of the Gaps. So the God of the Gaps is sort of a theory in this philosophical practice that there are these gods that exist in the gaps of human understanding. For example, 200 years ago, we had no idea what lightning was. If someone told you that it was God pointing his finger from heaven to shoot at people with electricity, that would make about as much sense as anything. So because we didn't yet understand how lightning works, to us that might as well have been a god. Or in other words, since it was a gap in our understanding, we attributed it as a supernatural thing. Okay, 500 years ago, that was the same situation with the sun and the moon and the stars. So these lesser gods or things of worship could just be those god of the gaps. There were people who worshiped the sun, there were people at the time who worshiped lightning, there were people who worshiped rain, and all these other phenomena that going off the canon of scripture would just be natural occurrences created by God. So to worship them would be to worship a lesser God. That was my philosophy of the day and that was the best I can do. I hope it wasn't awful. Jesus defeated other gods during the ascension. So after Jesus ascended into heaven, or more specifically as he was ascending into heaven, this is a theory that he literally had to fight his way there. This is going back to the idea of there being lesser gods, which I should mention, I didn't want to take away from everything I just said. All of that was my theory. There are several people who believe that there are lesser gods, and I'm not saying my belief system is any more legitimate than theirs. But this concept is that as he was ascending, and there was that still window of time that he was on earth, that the evil demons fought him, or that Satan himself fought him on the way into heaven. While there's no backing for this in scripture, it became an oral tradition that was passed down, that God had to slay demons, in other words, in order to rise to the right hand of the throne. And then finally, animals souls judging humans so remember how earlier i talked that around the throne of god there was the seraphim or the several winged angels well also mentioned to be around god were oxen and birds and beasts and several different animals so the idea behind it is since god is sitting on the throne and from the throne he judges if someone is saved or not again this is all according to the canon of Christianity, then maybe these things around the throne are part of it. And on top of that, maybe animals being a true neutral or a middle ground when it comes to judgment exist as the mediators to judge humanity. Or in other words, animals are neither good nor evil. They are simply instinctual and natural. So they work as the perfect litmus test of sorts for people being judged. So according to this belief, be nice to animals you'll literally go to hell for it. And that is it of the Bible theory iceberg. Um, thank you all so much for watching. <laughs> if you still are, I know this is like a really long video. Um, I've, I've been up quite literally like all night, uh, like researching and then recording. And then I'm going to have to get up and edit. Oh, I say have to, I love doing this. Uh, this is so fun to me. Um, I get to get up and edit, I should say. Um, but if you are still watching, thank you so much. Uh, this is something that I thought would be interesting. I just enjoy topics like this. I think that they're fun, um, not only as a Christian myself, but just to like communicate how crazy some of these ideas are to you all. Um, I, I think they're wild. And I don't mean crazy. I'm tired. I don't mean to be saying that. I don't mean crazy in like a derogatory way. I mean, it's crazy to think about. It's crazy to imagine some of these concepts and how wide stretching there are or what the implications of them could be. And I think they're really fun. So I wanted to get that across to you guys. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope this wasn't too boring. Uh, thank you for watching. If you still are, it means the most. Um, thank you so much to all my subscribers. 
we are to the moon and I can't get over it. Uh, you got, it's, it's amazing that I went from like half a year ago, like a thousand and now I'm at like 280 something. Um, you all have been fantastic. Just thank you. Uh, and thank you especially to all of my patrons and my top tier patrons that you can see here. I can't, uh, I talk about it all the time, but I can't imagine like supporting me monetarily. Um, it, it just blows my mind and it means the most. So thank you all for that. It really does mean a lot. Um, I've got more content coming out on the way, like I've talked about it summer so I can invest in it. Um, so hopefully you enjoy whatever comes next. I hope that this has been worth your time. And once again, thank you for everything. There will be another video, uh, let's say like start of next week. Hopefully we'll see. Um, I've got to do some moving around this weekend. So after that, we should be good to go. But thank you all so much for watching. Uh, it really does mean the most. I hope that you enjoyed uh, and I will see you in the next one.